Hello, Unicorn Herd. Welcome to another edition of Unicorn Chef with a good friend of mine. I guess most of them are good friends of mine. So, Matt, you're nothing special. You're just another good friend of mine. Unicorn Chef. Uh, tonight, we are not making jambalaya. If you saw that, we are going to be making gumbo instead. Uh, Matt will talk about the differences uh, when we get to the introduction. Uh, we always love to see what you make. So, hashtag Unicorn Chef. Share it with us and cook along. First up, Matt, what is tonight's charity? How can we donate and why did you choose it? Tonight's charity is the Trevor Project. You can find them at trevorproject.com. They're, uh, they're a fairly widely known charity. Um, they help support LGBTQ youth. And it means a lot to me, just specifically given my upbringing. Um, you've got to think about how difficult this can be specifically for the youth and for kids who are going through these kinds of things. Uh, my own personal experience, I was really, really lucky. Uh, because I left the house really quite young, uh, went off and joined the military. Oh, yes. Cross into the blue, whatever that means. And um, so I figured these things out for myself quite late. But my personal experience, uh, my father wasn't welcome in my own house by my own choosing for years. Um, and that's because these things are hard for families. And I was lucky because as an adult, I owned my own house, car, job, I was already married at the time, there's a lot more control you can have there. But that's not the case for so many people in the world today, and the Trevor Project helps out with that. So please do support them. Um, outstanding charity. I yeah, no, hey, I, don't, I don't know if you remember. It, it's quite inappropriate for this show, but that's fine. We're going to do it anyway. I don't know if you remember the joke I told you about um, your, you and your husband. Uh, 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 by Deadwood, right? Yep, yep. So we were flying back from uh, Deadwood, South Dakota. And this had to do with me getting strip searched by the... Uh, uh... Well, that was funny as fuck. <laughs> it's not that, but it did happen. Yes, true story. Let's start with that. Actually, hold on. Let's get, let's get, uh, let's get the show started. And then we're, I, I forgot about that. That was hilarious. So we're going to start with the story in Deadwood where um, I actually got to see um, a, a rated X film in real life with Matt. And then that led to the, the <laughs> joke that I made with, for him to repeat with his husband. Um, <laughs> funny. I forgot about that part. Man, that was such a great yeah. time at Wild West Hacking Fest. For those of you who don't know. Cut the corn, scoop the bread. It's, uh, it's every fall. Now they're moving it more to September. Deadwood, South Dakota. That's John Strand with uh, Black Hills. Um, awesome conference. Kind of that old school feel because – Deadwood, South Dakota literally cannot hold more people than they fit into that conference. So that is like, it has a hard cap. Um, so first question, Matt, what are you drinking for tonight? I'm having myself a Lef Blonde. It's a uh, Belgian beer. I'm a fan. Uh, what's, uh, where do you stand on um, Lambics? Um, I like them as a dessert. So like if I'm not, if the food's already done, um, just kind of chilling and you're sipping something, I'm cool with a Lambic. Um, but if you want something more full-bodied, and Dutch would say krachtig, I would not pick a Lambic most days. <laughs> I'm, I'm drinking a Durst Pilsner. Oh, very nice. Ironically, a Pilsner is a better choice with a meal that we're going to be making tonight than a, uh, a Belgian blonde. It's a little bit too thick, if you will, of a flavor. Um, whereas a Pilsner is very refreshing because so what we're going to be making is a little bit on the spicier side, but you have a lot of control of that. We'll do a lot of swap outs and such. Uh, but a Pilsner to refresh the, the palate is really good with a gumbo. All right. Take us away, my friend. All righty. So let's talk about what you need. First off, most important piece of utility for gumbo is a wooden spoon. I know, I know, I know. You would think that if we're going to stir something, you could use a rubber spoon or something of the sorts. If you're using a metal spoon, that can work, but your pan using to make ourselves a roux might scratch with that. So you ideally don't want to do that, particularly if it's a Teflon pan. Uh, you don't want to scratch Teflon, could be toxic. The thing about a roux is that a roux is the most important and the most uh, central part to any gumbo, but you have to make it very, very hot. Essentially, there's two components to a roux. It is all-purpose flour, like this or any kind of flour to be fair, and also some kind of oil, typically a vegetable oil. And you do your very best to get it as close to burning as you can 
without actually burning it. So if it looks like it's burnt, but it doesn't taste like it's burnt and it's not black, you made a good roux. The problem with that is that means it's very, very hot. So if you use a spoon like this, you have to be very, very careful with your movements when you're stirring it, or it will melt, and you do not want to have melted rubber inside of your roux. I have done that before. Not a good idea. This won't happen if you have a, if you have a, uh, a wooden spoon. So if you have a wooden spoon, don't even worry about it. Don't have to be careful. We just stir away. We'll be good to go. The second piece about a gumbo, and this is also with a jambalaya, is you've got to have yourself some rice. Oh, yes. Um, it adds a lot of extra arsenic, which keeps the flavor good. I'm kidding. But rice does have a fair amount of arsenic. Is that, a, is that like a ricin joke? A ricin note? <laughs> I don't think ricin is related to, to rice, is it? No, it, not at, no, not at all. Not at all. But when you brought up arsenic, I was just like, what are we doing here? Like, don't get, don't get your produce from China, okay? Or Russia, for that matter. <laughs> But the, uh, the thing that'll take the longest here is gonna be the rice. So we're probably gonna start with that. You take any kind of standard rice cooker that you got here, and we can use that in order to allegedly get it running. We don't have to be careful with the rice or anything special of that. But Bryson was talking about the difference between jambalaya and gumbo. There are a few differences, but the big major one is that with a gumbo, you make the rice and the rice is on its own. And then you make the gumbo and then you add the gumbo on top of the rice. In jambalaya, you make them both together. So the rice is actually part of the meal. There's actually a couple downsides to that. It's that gumbo is one of the best in the world dishes for leftovers. Oh my gosh, is gumbo amazing for leftovers. In fact, uh, the recipe we're gonna be making today is on my is one of my grandmother's. Uh, so if you're from Southern Louisiana, one of the things that gets passed down as an heirloom is cutlery or cookware, and the secret, sacred gumbo reference, or uh, oops, recipe rather. And uh, I beat out all of my cousins and siblings and I won that one. Oh yes, go me, go me. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to gumbo, the thing that you have to know for, for um, uh, kind of the way that works familially is that everyone comes to that one person in the family, grandmother, whoever it might be, and you come by and there's already food there. It's food that's already ready. You got the comp pie, um, you got the gumbo. And the reason is it's, it's just, it's sitting there, it's heating up or it's already heated up or maybe it's being reheated. Um, and you come in and you just eat and you share family. That's, that's just so amazing. Uh, one of the things I love about Louisiana, but gumbo is amazing for this because in the case of gumbo, it's always fresh because you make the gumbo and you make the rice separate. So we never, we want to make new, like reheat the gumbo, you still have fresh rice. It's fantastic. So let's go ahead and start off with the rice. Uh, Use the standard trick, right? You put a little bit of rice in the bowl, and then you wash it. So you're gonna wash the rice a couple times here to get the arsenic out, Bryson. To get the arsenic out. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have to, I have to actually point out that tonight's episode we have our first sponsor. Um, so the the apron is courtesy of Tony Hunt, and I'm gonna call out his um, his business. Um, custom roasted, so makes awesome coffee, um, including they have a red team flavor. A red team flavor, ooh. I think I saw that on Twitter the other day. Mm -hmm. I just, it's such a cool apron. So we got the unicorn dabbing with the, the knives. Thanks, Tony. <clears throat> gumbo layo, gumbo layo. And then as soon as your rice doesn't have that milky uh, cast to the water anymore, and then you can go ahead and fill it up. Let's go ahead and do the finger trick. Fill up that finger. Toss it in the rice cooker. Why don't you explain the finger trick real quick? Because I think a lot of people um, kind of over focus on the measurement. And the finger trick is the I don't have to measure my water and my rice. Just... So you've got your little rice cooker in the bowl, you like to see here. And then the way the finger trick roll works is that you fill it up until the water level reaches that first knuckle on your finger. As soon as that happens, you've got enough water in there, feel free to toss it into the rice cooker and go to town. Um, yeah, I know a lot of folks, they'll, they'll do specific measurements. Uh, if that's you, don't worry, we're gonna fix you tonight. <laughs> uh, there is almost nothing I've ever seen in a good gumbo recipe that goes to a specific measurement. In fact, my grandmother wasn't just uh, the, the cook of the family, she was actually a professional cook for the majority of her life. 
And the hardest thing for me, learning to cook from her, was that there's never any measurement. It's like, toss some stuff in, toss some more stuff in, taste it, it feels good, go with it. With a couple caveats. In fact, sometimes you put something in and it tastes right when it's being cooked, but then perhaps it doesn't, it tastes different when it's done. Uh, specifically, flavors. So if you got a flavor, it's always going to be stronger, generally speaking, when it's done, particularly if you're cooking some of the water because it'll get thicker and it'll, it'll intensify, if you will. So always go for a little bit lighter than you hope. And then once it's done, you'll get a little bit more. Did you cook with your grandmother a lot when uh, you were a kid? Um, throughout the years, occasionally, yes, but my family was very, very military. And so we lived all over the place. And that's, in fact, that's one of the reasons why my grandmother, uh, was more involved with me cooking than most of the rest of my, uh, uh, relatives, because it was the way that we could reconnect after having been in the Azores for two years and not having seen family or Germany or Japan or wherever it might've been. Alrighty. Let me know when you're ready with the uh, rice there, Bryson. We're gonna my, over to yep, I'm already on rice. I'm, uh, I've actually just started my roux. Outstanding. So the roux is the most difficult part about a gumbo by far, but it's actually pretty simple as far as what it is. It is vegetable oil. Oops, there it goes. Vegetable oil, and it is flour. That's all there is to a roux. But with a roux, the difficult part is in... Not burning it. <laughs> That's so the real there is to. When you make a roux, including in other dishes, you only make it with oil. You never make it with butter. Um, so you can make it with butter. You can also make it with a bacon fat. Um, I find that in both cases to be more difficult. Um, and with a roux, generally speaking, what you're looking for is you're looking for something that's going to thicken whatever it is that you're making just a little bit more, right? To thicken the dish, particularly if it's into a soup, it'll thicken it with that flour. Uh, and then with the roux, you're gonna get a lot of smokiness as far as flavor goes, uh, which means that if you're looking for extra flavor from a butter or from a bacon, you can get those without using a roux to do so. So can you do it? Absolutely. Uh, bacon will pop, which makes it, in my opinion, quite a lot harder to make the roux. But you can absolutely do that. You can absolutely do that. All right. So we've got some oil. It's heating up in the pan. And then we're just going to grab ourselves some flour. Nothing special here. Nothing crazy. We're just going to toss it. We're probably going to use more flour here over time. But our biggest objective is we're just going to keep stirring it. Now, you can use any kind of pan to do this. Uh, so here I'm using cast iron. That's very traditional. Uh, if you're not using cast iron, it's likely going to be a larger pan than this, which is actually very nice because roux really takes a decent amount of effort to make. But if you've made it, you made it, right? So you want to just reuse it. For example, if I were to open up my kitchen uh, 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 refrigerator, <laughs> I've got roux here. Uh, in fact, some of the roux that I've got in my refrigerator is still from my grandmother. This stuff is just vegetable oil and flour. It will hold in the refrigerator essentially forever. So if yeah, you're making I mean, it- fat, fat oil doesn't, doesn't really go bad. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So if you're making it, oftentimes you want to make a lot and then not may have to worry about it the next time you make gumbo. So the roux is the hardest part. If you make it once, you can often get away with like three or four gumbo dishes over the over you know a couple months period before you have to make it again. That is really interesting. I have never made excess roux and thought to reuse it. Well, you probably don't make gumbo every other month, do you? <laughs> no, but I, I make no, I don't. But I make a, a lot of dishes with a, with a roux for a base. I mean, if I'm making a bechamel, I'm going to use a roux. Um, there are a lot of French dishes that have different roux, um, so I do make a roux fa fairly often. Um, but I've never it never occurred to me that I could just make a whole bunch because I basically I make enough for the 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 dish I'm making. The dish you're making, yeah. I've never just made a lot and then like stored it. That's kind of, that's really clever. That's a really neat um, time-saving trick. Grandmother tricks. So in, in this case, if you look at the roux, how I've got it now, if you go to a lot of gumbo places, particularly in the North, it's gonna look this color, the roux. Ouch, that was painful. Can't see it. It's a, I see a, yeah, it's like a golden yellowish. Yeah, like doughy. And so if you use it like this, it will thicken whatever it is that you're making. So the primary effect that you're looking for with a roux will happen. Um, however, the flavor you're looking for from a roux. Well, camera is not where I expected to be. There we go. The flavor you're looking for in a roux is going to be completely missed if you do it like this. Okay. Um, 
which in some dishes is not the biggest idea, uh, biggest issue because sometimes you're not really looking for that heavy smokiness. But uh, in a gumbo, that is that is what makes it distinctive. That's what sets it apart. So you really want to uh, to avoid that. In this case, I actually spilled a little bit of the roux on my foot when I was trying to show it to the camera. So I have to add a little bit more. You probably won't need to do this. Um, that's similar to uh, we had Jonathan Rohn, who uh, uh, was a professional Cajun cook. And he taught uh, sofrito. And it's the same kind of thing where you burn the tomato um, to get that deeper um, color and flavor. Yeah, I find that whole idea of like getting something as close to burning as possible in order to just completely change the flavor profile for whatever it is you're making to be so fascinating. Because there's a lot of dishes that'll do something like that. So this part does take a little while. You're gonna have to keep stirring it. Yeah, in so fact, it's gonna is, stick uh, it up. I just started to get some dark brown elements. Ah, perfect. So how, how dark are we aiming for overall? We wanna get as close to black as we can without getting it to black. Um, it's really hard for me to explain how dark because I am in fact colorblind. <laughs> so it never actually really looked brown to me. I can mostly just tell when it's not good. <laughs> All right, so as you start to make the roux, it'll start to thicken up because the, um, uh, the vegetable oil is gonna get absorbed into that uh, uh, flour. And it's gonna start to smell a little bit like popcorn as you do it. And it'll look a little bit like this where it's not so much liquidy anymore as it is, there we go, as it is kind of starting to uh, become thicker. And as soon as this happens, that's when it's going to start to change color. If you leave it on the pan for too long, it will burn. So here's where it becomes tough. You've got to keep moving it, just keep moving it. And to be fair, everything after this part for gumbo is really, really easy. It's just getting that roux ready. So we're going to be at this for probably a good five, 10 minutes or so as we start to get it really dark. But right. um, well, while we're doing that, what do you do for a living? I work for a company called Open Security. And I say work for, <laughs> I founded a company called Open Security and we do all kinds of cybersecurity work. Uh, in fact, I have worked with Bryson in a bunch of cases by his side uh, because we do red teaming. We do red teaming all the time. Um, one of my favorite styles of work to do because it's every time it's unique and interesting. I know a lot of people in information security tend to work for, say, an organization doing security for that organization. And there's something to be said for learning your network and, and really kind of embodying it over time. <laughs> but there's something crazy about seeing a new network every single day. And um, you kind of get to laugh about that a little bit, right? Because you'll see the craziest things, the craziest things. Uh, once broke into a bank and found out that we were totally not supposed to be there. Uh, Wait, wrong bank? No, no, it was it was the right bank, but it was a franchise, and the corporate didn't realize that their franchise agreement obviously does not say you can break into any of our franchise facilities, right? What kind of franchise agreement does something like that? That's crazy. <laughs> but um, yeah, this is actually when I was working at Black Hills. Uh, so at Open Security, we do a lot of the same style of work, but at this time, I was working at Black Hills. And I was there with a, a coworker of mine called Sally, and uh, her name's Sally. And we were in this bank. We broke in. They uh, uh, they had those kind of locks the front that are motion actuated. So I literally took a clothes hanger and I put I taped I taped a piece of paper onto it. Stood up between the doors. I wiggled that sucker around. Doors open. Awesome. And we're going to town. So we we're, we're in this we're in this bank. We're doing all kinds of stuff for a while. And then I go to the printer because printers are always a great place to find some really sensitive information. And on the printer, I see the first thing, like kid you not, the first thing that's on the printer is a franchise agreement. And I look at that thing and it's night. There's nobody else around us. And I turn to Sally and I'm like, we got to get out of here <laughs> right now. <laughs> oh. But isn't it great when that's cybersecurity? <laughs> All right, uh, my um, yeah, my roof's my roof's getting there, it's getting dark. Yeah, me too. So on the roof side, I'm looking. It almost, like it almost has like a kind of like uh, redolent of uh, burnt popcorn. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Actually, very much like that. And so the thing is, you can actually stop here where we're kind of at, and it will work. Um, 
my ideal color is like this. So this here is prepare brew that's already done. A little hard to see, but it is, it is about two, three shades darker than where we're probably at right now. But this is the point where it gets really tough. If you, um, if you don't keep stirring, it will burn in, in a second or two. So at this point, you want to just keep going, keep going. You might still be getting hints of that popcorn scent as well. But here at this point, we are um, we're smoking it. We're smoking it really, really hard. Um, and that's what really is that legal in your state? What's that? Is that legal in your state? Smoking it really hard? No, it's not. That's not legal in Texas. <laughs> You'll get there. Don't worry. Your state. See, okay, in Texas, so. in Texas, we believe in freedom, and because we believe in freedom, you're not allowed to do anything. <laughs> no, you are you free can do anything Texas. that everybody else tells you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Alrighty, we are very, very close here. I'm actually gonna call mine done. I might have gone a little bit too overboard on mine here. Yeah, I did. Alrighty, well, don't be me. I went a little bit too, too hard on my room. Uh, once you do so, in fact, it's actually a pretty good learning moment. Once you do so, you can see a little bit of smoke like this coming out. And that's because it's burned. This is, this is done. You have to throw it out and start again. Fortunately, I can prepare it with extra roux. You don't want to do this. This is really bad. I get a little aggressive, a little greedy with it. Uh, if you get more greedy and you win, you get payoff, then you're going to have yourself a fantastic gumbo. If you lose, it's not going to be ideal. But fortunately, my demo roux is only the tip of the iceberg. I've got more. Uh, the demo god's got you. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I went. I went too much. Oof. I haven't done that in a while. <laughs> you uh, distracted me, 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 Bryce, me. and it's all your fault. I no, you. no, it's the curse of Mike Ellis. I'm sorry. Curse I should have told Ellis. you. It's kind of like Phantom of the Opera. He's gonna show up like this and like. Argh! I don't even need that. I just do this. <laughs> well, he doesn't have hair, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Alrighty. Right, Gumbolio. So, uh, I, I assume you're putting your other roux back in, and then we're going to take the next step. Oh no, my I've, I've got extra roux, so uh, so yeah, that's what I mean. The, that, the other roux. Yep, we're good to go. So the next step here is we're going to grab ourselves a pot. You can use a uh, a more traditional pot like this. This is a cast iron pot from my grandmother. Unlike the skillet, I'm actually not going to use this. It's a bit shallow, and so in gumbo, oftentimes when you grab yourself a stirring spoon like this, you're going to have to stir it a bit. If you stir a little aggressively, it'll spill over. I hate the mess, so I like myself a deep pot. A little bit less traditional, but I really do like it. And so in this case, we're gonna fill it up with a bundle of water. How much water, you might say? That eh, doesn't matter. If we have more water, we need more roux. If we have more water, we need some more of the, uh, the ingredients, the beef stock and the chicken stock that we're gonna be adding in. If we have less water, we just need less, less of that. For me personally, I tend to go with a little bit less water first, and I might grab myself a cup and add on, add on if I need to. So we'll put this over the stove here, and we'll turn it on. Now, a lot of folks don't realize this next part, but gumbo is actually a tomato-based soup. If you look at gumbo when it's served, it's all full of rice, doesn't really look like a soup. Gumbo is actually a soup. It's a soup you put on top of the rice and it doesn't look like a soup anymore when you're done. But the soup itself is tomato based. So we're gonna use ourselves a little bit of tomato paste. Paste dragging. Yep, well, no, yeah, it's tomato paste. Yeah. <laughs> and some stewed tomatoes as well. Uh, you're supposed to use two of these. Generally speaking, I would use two of these, but uh, I failed and I only got one for some reason, who knows. Uh, the thing that's nice about gumbo though, is that once you've got the roux right, don't be me, get it right. <laughs> once you've got the roux right, there's very little that can go wrong with gumbo. Gumbo is in the category of dishes that we talk about all the time as um, hold on, hold leftovers. On, wait, just, Matt, can I interrupt you there for a second? Yes. So if you have roux left, that can be roux right? <laughs> roux ref, roux right? <laughs> yes, yes, roux ref can be roux right. Hopefully it is roux right. You didn't keep it ref if you wanted to want it right, right? Right? Uh, Matt, you've been compared to being a, a much hotter uh, Rachel Ray already by our audience. I can take it. <laughs> you know, he's a very natural. Sort of, I mean, if the apron fits. 
you know, if the um, if the glove fits, got to quit or doesn't fit. Forget about it. Who knows? <laughs> but yeah. Um, oh man, they make your roux wrong too. You can smell it, and I've got that going throughout the house right now. If those like detectors go off. You know what I did wrong? I um, my grandmother's turning over her grave. Oh, terrible. So make sure you've got yourself a uh, can opener. We're just going to open up our tomato paste and our stewed tomatoes, which we're going to add to the water. Rachel Ray style. If I trip over, it's totally for comedy purposes, but my dog is like standing right beneath me because she knows what's about to start going in. Oh, right, I was talking about it being a, um, a leftover style dish. So in a lot of cultures, there's, there's these dishes where it's, you've got leftovers of some sort, one or of, of another, and um, you have to figure out something to make with that, right? In Italy, it might be pizza. So you've, you've got something sitting in the cupboard, you've got dough all the time, and you've probably got some tomato paste or whatnot, and cheese, and then you throw whatever proteins on top of it you, you, you've got you know, handy. In Spain, it might be a quiche. In Holland or Germany, it's definitely potatoes and sausage. <laughs> uh, with some kind of cabbage, some kind of cabbage as well. And uh, let's see, in Southern Louisiana, it's gonna be your gumbo, which means that from this point forward, it's really make your own choice as far as what you'd like. For example, my mother, she is uh, allergic to shrimp. And so if I was making this for her, these suckers ain't going in. And that's just perfectly fine because gumbo is not, not a very particular dish. It's, uh, it's all about putting in what you've got handy and what you've got left over, which is why for tonight, our primary protein is actually going to be the quintessential leftover chicken. I have here a rotisserie chicken that um, uh, smelled really good when I got it and I ate some stuff off of it. I got to share, I did something a little different. Um, in the, in the, I'm not having leftover chicken because the, the chicken I made last night with the, the last bit of uh, half a chicken I had was an Indian style dish, which I didn't really want to mix the flavors, although it probably would have turned out fine. And the problem is I ate it all. Um, <laughs> Big so, problem. Uh, they had a, they had a sale on chicken breasts. And since you had mentioned how shredded chicken, which of course you're going to shred your chicken off yours. Um, I threw some chicken breasts with, um, diced tomatoes and water in a crock pot that's just been sitting all day. So I'm going to have naturally shredded chicken right out of my crock pot. It's already been working. That sounds fantastic, actually. In fact, if you really want to make like cuisine uh, gumbo, oftentimes that's the kind of thing that you might do. Is you'll, you'll cook the chicken itself. Um, for time purposes and others, <laughs> we're just going to do it with pre-cooked chicken. So if you're watching this and trying to follow along, and you're making it off of raw chicken, perfectly fine. Uh, I recommend drum uh, uh, legs, chicken legs, drumsticks, is that right? Yeah, drumsticks. I recommend drumsticks because you can put the bone in uh, and there's a lot of flavor that'll come off that into the broth. But, um, but yeah, you can totally do it with raw chicken. If you do it with raw chicken though, uh, it needs to cook longer and I recommend sauteing the chicken, seasoning it, flavoring it, sauteing it on both sides because it'll keep the flavor in the meat as opposed to getting it stripped out from the actual uh, soup that is gumbo. But um, but in this case, I'm taking the laser rat out. And if I'm honest, this is how I typically do it. I'll, I'll grab um, some kind of, almost always a rotisserie chicken actually, um, enjoy it. And then what I've got left over, that becomes some of the primary protein into the actual gumbo. Oh, I forgot. I did something a little extra. And so I did have leftovers and this was an interesting one. So I made patatas bravas over uh, the weekend and I flavored my, my bravas sauce, which, which means brave sauce. So it's basically just a spicy tomato sauce. Um, with uh, whole sardines. So I oh, threw the leftover sardines in here to give it a little bit more of that deep umami kind of flavor because you don't actually Come taste on. the sardines. It's not like it tastes fishy. It just gives yeah. it like a deeper flavor. So little, little, little leftover addition that's going on in mine. And, and to be fair, like any kind of leftover protein will often work. Sardines a great idea. Uh, we would often do crab. So uh, my grandmother would take me crab fishing occasionally in Louisiana. And uh, it, as an adult, I'm realizing that this is probably wasn't the most healthy thing, right? If you're in Louisiana, 
all of the oil <laughs> production. It's not exactly the best water there. And crabs are bottom feeders, so is that why you have such here. thick, beautiful hair, Matt? Is because you just yes, grew up on a the, diet um, of arsenic and hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons combusted in my meal. Yeah. Well, I just have a, a regular old uh, <laughs> Phillips already ganned uh, claw meat that I'm going to toss in. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. Um, huh. I think in the recipe I did actually mention crab lump. And for whatever reason, I also didn't buy that this time around. But yeah, crab meat is always great to have in a gumbo too. Um, but again, it's all about what you like, right? If you don't like crab, skip it. If you don't like uh, uh, chicken, well, I don't know how you live on earth, but... Okay, go for it. <laughs> uh, shrimp is actually probably one of the more debatable pieces of a gumbo. It's very traditional to have shrimp in it, but uh, shrimp's expensive. And um, so if you're, if you're having a, a, like a, a leftover style dish, traditionally, of course, you want it to be a cheaper meal as well. And the thing that you cut from that is shrimp every single time. You always, you always cut the shrimp. Uh, so if you want to make gumbo and make it really affordable, cut the shrimp, you still have an amazing meal. Uh, if you still wanted to be a little bit fishy, you can add fish sauce to it, but I don't. I don't recommend that. <laughs> What's the weirdest thing you've ever put in your gumbo? Ribs. Yeah, uh, pork ribs. I bet that actually was really good. It, it was actually really, really good. Um, I don't know if I'd do it again because I'm a big fan of ribs in general, so they don't normally last me long enough for it to get to that point. But um, yes, I'm stuffing chicken in my mouth while I'm making this. I can't help myself. <laughs> I'm going to be smoking some ribs this weekend. It's my Memorial Day plans. Oh, that's a perfect dish for Memorial Day. I actually had ribs, what, two days ago? Something like that? Love myself some ribs. All right. So in my case, I've got most of my chicken out. And we now have ourselves our stewed tomatoes and our tomato paste in as well. So we want to add in our base at this point. You can add in your base before you add in the chicken if you'd like to. Either way. A little bit easier to see it if you're if you're judging by color. Uh, if you put the base in first, in this case we're gonna do a chicken base, and we're gonna do ourselves a beef base as well. That's how I made it. I actually skipped the beef base and I went with a um, uh, a vegetable base that works too. But um, I like a little bit more of the meaty flavor that you get from a beef base. Not everyone does. Uh, so if there's one to be light on, choose the beef. Now what we're doing here when we're adding in this bouillon is it's also going to add a lot of salt into the dish, which is good. We we want that. But what you have to realize is the salt's already in the dish. So don't add in extra salt. Get a little bit of sea salt here, just in case, because we're gonna taste to flavor and then we'll add and adjust and those kind of things. Uh, but you will typically not need to add much in the way of sea salt. Probably won't want to add it in at all, honestly. And this is the part where those uh, those red team fit muscles come in handy. Oh yeah, open that. And I'm gonna fail here. There we go, did it. Did it! <laughs> How goes your journeys there, uh, by the way, Bryson? What was that? How goes your journeys there? I haven't seen you do one of those uh, those like Tabata style workout. Oh, uh, in a while. yeah. So um, <laughs> I've actually been dealing with old age injuries. Um, <laughs> so uh, I uh, am not working out as much as I used to. I have started um, leading yoga again. So there, there were three classes this week. The next one is on Friday. There's one this morning at 930. The next one is... Friday at 9 a.m. So I'm I'm trying to get back to that. Part of it also is my schedule. So um, I can't go into a lot of detail, but I am an expert witness in a major court case, and that is taking a ton of my time. I know that feeling. I've been there a time or two. Yeah. You having fun with that? I always have a lot of fun when I'm doing expert witness work. Um. I mean, I like, so I mean, what's going to come out of that is going to completely change the way things are done in this country. So there's a little bit of pressure, um, I but I like making a difference. I, I believe what I'm doing. Um, nine hours with the state AG on Friday was pretty painful. Oh, man. But I've been through SEER school, so it actually felt like <laughs> training for interrogation. Are you seriously Barry, that's a SEER? <laughs> I mean, the stakes weren't the same, and I wasn't being like physically tortured at the same time. But it at least wasn't the rendition portion. <laughs> <laughs> but like you know, there was like a definitely sort of a, a the the logic chess match, and I could see where he was trying to get me to admit things, and 
that's very similar to what you do in interrogation. And I honestly, that's true. Um, in, in real interrogation, it's not that they come and like jack power you, um, they but uh, no. they try to get you trapped in, in different things, but mm-hmm. different things. And then they just have that unravel. Because most people, yeah, will, yeah, right. do a little like thwack thing too. Well, that's back of the hands, the ribs. Oh yeah, I got singled out in Sears, so uh, that was uh, that was a fun <laughs> experience. Why were, Why were you singled out? I had a cell phone on me. <laughs> what? Hold on. Yeah. Why did you? I, did, I didn't know. The field, dude. Um, so so I um. They came and they hauled us all off on a single day for the first part of rendition, in fact. And I wasn't paying attention. And I just threw on my old uh, um, ABUs from the previous day. And um, I, I literally f- found out, or I literally realized that I had a cell phone in my pocket when they put a bag over my head. That's when I figured it out. And uh, uh, oops. So that was not a fun experience for me. I, uh, I had to live with that one for the rest of the period. Uh, I was not singled singled out, and I followed my training and kept my head down and did all the things I was supposed to do. And that, to be that fair, thing, that means that I probably have a more accessible experience than you do. Okay, I got Jack Bauer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I watched other people get like roughed up, but you know, ironically, my uh, yeah, I, I my roommate of the Academy, academy I met him because he watched me getting singled out. <laughs> He was like, oh, that must have sucked, man. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I, I watched it happen to other people. So uh, I I feel bad for you and not bad for you at the same time. You should have known better. Oh, you're right. I, t- I totally should have known better. But um, but yeah. I got a story out of it. That's at the very least. You know what? If I If I were here today without that story, I'd probably be worse off. So who sucked the uh, who sucked the eyeballs out in your stick? Sucked my eyeballs out. Not sucked oh. your eyeballs. Sucked the rabbit's eyeballs out. Yeah, you're talking about stick. with uh, yeah survival. The survival um, phase. Well, not me. I didn't do that shit. <laughs> no, the worst part for me that one was the chickens. Oh Boo. my god. Chickens for you? The rabbits weren't too bad because well, we're kind of. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Is it going off? It's the rice cooker. It's the rice cooker. Oh, it's the rice cooker. I was, I was hoping. We're, there are a lot of people hoping for fire. Yes. The Part of it is that's the only way they not. understand how to cook. So don't, don't take it personally, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, because rabbits are actually fairly easy to clean, right? Like they're not. Oh, yeah. They're, you, you, you the just... reason they have rabbits is because they look cute and they want to make mm-hmm. you realize that you can still eat it even if it looks cute. <laughs> well, so I have taken the skill set with me. I hunt rabbits in my yard. Oh, really? Yes. I actually had rabbits as a kid when I was in the Azores. Also military, but yeah. <clears throat> so they just they raised them there for uh, for food. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I, need I, have a, I have a pretty good looking uh, soup here. All right. So next piece about the soup here. Um, also. Start chopping up your green uh, bell pepper. You want to add that in next. Actually, with gumbo, unlike jambalaya, so jambalaya actually has a fair amount of vegetables in it. Uh, gumbo can, uh, but typically doesn't have anything explicit. So with, with gumbo, we're normally talking about a green bell pepper and green onions and okra. I personally don't like okra. Uh, I think it's fine when it's fried. Like I like fried okra, but if you put it in something that's a little bit watery, like a soup, like gumbo, it gets slimy, and I don't like that. So I always leave the okra out. Um, I, so it's funny when you say that. I, I was going to ask if you'd done okra for thickening. So it doesn't get slimy when you when you do it. It actually just thickens the sauce. And hmm. then the okra itself that loses its slimy factor. Like okra by itself uncooked is slimy. Do you cook it before you put it in then? No. I just boil it out. I almost thought about throwing okra in here. In fact, I almost thought about throwing. I got some fresh zucchini. I thought about adding zucchini to this. Yeah, you can do that as well. I mean, to be fair, uh, gumbo is, again, all about being a leftovers dish. So if you've got leftovers, you can totally toss them in. The typical three base is bell pepper, green onion, and okra. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I can experiment with okra a bit more and get better results, but I've always disliked it. So uh, so I used uh, – I actually did okra in the uh, – the, sorry, did I say – I don't remember what I said. But I, the jambalaya I made with Jonathan, I used okra in that. So that episode, I actually did over. A-
Well, you're back. What's going on? I don't know. It looks like I'm frozen, don't I? I mean, I know Texas is a third world country, but seriously, come on. I mean, have you seen our power grid? I'm just saying. I have. In fact, uh, I am familiar with it. I had, uh, I had uh, um, a lady from who used to be at ERCOT on my podcast uh, last month. Small world. Oh, you didn't hear anything I just said. Oh, I did. I did. I, I can still hear you. It's just uh, cameras having a little trouble. Yeah. I think so it's actually. I had, uh, I had a lady that was at ERCOT on my podcast last month. Yeah, that is a really small world. Oh, come on, camera. We can get you fixed. Come on, put all that sands training to work. I, I, this is this is literally what I do for a living. So for those who don't know, I'm an instructor with the Sands Institute, and I teach a number of courses, Security 560, uh, 460 I'm the author of, that's the uh, vulnerability assessment class, and then um, I'm writing a class right now called SEC 665, which is on uh, red teaming, advanced red teaming, in fact. I have to say, it's a really, really fun class to write. In fact, what is my advanced RSA, red teaming? Advanced red teaming? Um, it's making red team look nothing like a pen test at all. <laughs> um, so a lot more effects driven, right? Because uh, with, with red teaming, uh, it's, it's not just about doing things that are more advanced. It's also about testing the blue team to see how they perform against different stuff. So if your blue team is performing very well in a certain way, we want to find out how they're not doing well, right? And then we might need to craft custom styles of say, threat emulation against whatever the blue team is doing in order to figure out what they're not doing. Well, because <clears throat> everyone, no, no one's perfect, right? No one's perfect. Uh, red teamers aren't perfect. Blue teamers aren't perfect. doesn't matter who you are. Nobody knows everything. But the red teamer's job is really interesting because oftentimes the red team, as a red teamer, your primary job is to figure out what the blue team needs to learn. Not, not necessarily just to, to teach them or to train them, but to figure out where they break and where they start to kind of fall apart, uh, which is an amazing kind of position to be in because it means that your job is never going to be the same week to week if you're doing it right and if you're empowered to do it right. That's the other thing. Sometimes we'll see red teamers who, uh, who would be totally capable of doing that and really want to, but don't have that kind of buy-in from the organization, which really sucks. That's really unfortunate. <clears throat> but uh, what advanced red teaming is all about is kind of building those engagements, building those exercises and having the expertise to do that as well. So that might be things like malware engineering, right? So a big portion of that class is actually – not just about bypassing antivirus, but building custom uh, uh, attackware in order to demonstrate where antivirus doesn't really perform that well. Um, and the custom is really where they, they don't, <laughs> where they really have a lot of trouble, uh, which is just fine. It's just fine. I was actually in a Twitter debate. Excuse me. I was in a Twitter argument, okay? It was angry. There was a lot of rage, at least uh, cyber rage. Yes, totally. And uh, it was about, hey, stop hating on EDR. EDR is really great because EDR can find stuff. It's really hard to bypass EDR. That's actually not only not true, it's also not the point. It's even in the name, right? EDR stands for Endpoint Detection Response. And it's amazing because it helps Blue Team do what Blue Team needs to do. It doesn't mean it detects bad stuff. All it does is give Blue Team the opportunity to do so. And um, in advanced Red Team, we're not looking to just bypass solutions. We're looking to determine where they uh, where they start to fall apart, where they break apart. And that's what six six five is about. So when uh, when's that going to debut? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> if you had asked me like two weeks ago, <laughs> I would have told you it was going to debut in December. Uh, but Sands is doing a lot of work on a lot of different solutions right now um, for ranges and making sure things always run really smoothly and. Evidently, I drew the short straw, and that's all hitting at the exact same time as I'm making this class, uh, which means I have to kind of re-envision how the network is going to work. <laughs> and I have no idea how long that's going to take. So, As far as the class goes, most of it's actually pretty close to done. Heck, uh, I did a presentation at RSA. Was that last week? That was last week. Yeah, last week. And that was a beta of the first set of labs from 665. Um, went off without a hitch, actually. Even built this full like range provisioning system. This was actually was really cool. One of the reasons I'm really enjoying making this class is because it's letting me learn again. Um, as a business owner, you find that you start to learn less and less and less as years go by. And at first, I was like, "Oh man, 
that means that I'm just, I figured it all out. I know everything, right? There's nothing left for me to learn. Yeah, no. <laughs> it just has to do with a lot of revectoring your focus. And um, I don't know. I think there's a lot of people in information security who went into this field because it's constantly challenging you. But at a certain point, you have to realize that if you want to continue to be constantly challenged, you actually have to look for it. You have to look for it really, really hard. And uh, that's been the most enjoyable part about making this class for me is that it's forcing me to, to look at everything again within a, within a new light. Um, and I love that, that whole journey to uh, figure things out, right? It's, it's all the art of the hack. All right. Mm -hmm. I got this Dicing up all these vegetables chorizo now. I'm using instead of andouille, and it's fantastic. A chorizo sausage? Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Yeah, mm. so, so Bryce is bringing up sausages here. I've actually got two sausages with me. I'm going to split. Oh, that looks pretty. Oh, man. And uh, so I've got andouille, which is very traditional. I'm not actually, generally speaking, a huge fan of it, but there's a reason why you use this in gumbo that I'll mention just a little bit. And then I've also got this Eckridge smoked sausage, and it's just like, like grabbing it and like stuffing it in my mouth. Oh. I'm a sucker for it. I'll be honest. But one of the reasons why an andouille sausage is really nice in a gumbo is because it's a little, I don't want to say drier. That makes it sound nasty. That's not true. Uh, it's very flavorful, but it's not as mushy, I guess, as a standard sausage. But mostly what I mean here with, uh, with an andouille is that gumbo is a soup, right? So there's a lot of water to it. Whatever protein you're using, whatever protein you're using, doesn't matter what it is, the soup is itself going to extract a lot of that flavor and pull it into the broth. In some ways, it's a really good thing because it means that your broth is going to be very flavorful. It's going to taste fantastic. That's great. But the other side is if it's been in there for long enough, your, your, uh, your proteins are going to start to taste a little bit less like themselves, right? So you're going to have sausage that tastes bland. Uh, and Dooley sausage is very, very good about retaining its flavor. That's one of the reasons why it's the primary one you would typically use in, in, uh, uh, in gumbo, regardless of whether you prefer it or not, it just, it retains the flavor a lot. Uh, so in my case, I actually prefer the smoked sausage to an andouille sausage, but, um, but it's, it's nice to go at least half and half just because it'll retain the flavor a lot better. Now, if I'm making, uh, leftovers, what I might add is I might actually add some additional proteins, particularly if it's a protein that's already pre-cooked, like a lot of these sausages are, uh, in which case I'll add on some extra, say smoked sausage, but I won't actually make that as part of the standard gumbo. I add that in uh, when I'm making a new pot of rice or whatnot, whatever it might be, uh, which is fantastic. So we want to go ahead and chop up that sausage, make it look a little bit like that. And then once we've got it chopped up, we'll just slide that right in the gumbo as well. <clears throat> what you might've noticed is I'm occasionally adding a little bit of water to the gumbo. Uh, this is a little bit tough to discern, but you can kind of tell by the color and then also once you've added in your base, right, you can pull in a little bit of it onto a spoon like this and taste it. And you can tell by the flavor if it's too thick. Uh, it'll taste really, really rich if it's too thick. Careful, it is boiling, so blow on it. Um, and in my case, mine is actually just on the dot. It's just about right. We haven't added in the roux yet, though. So recognize it's going to get a little bit thicker. The roux is not going to change the... The um, richness of the flavor profile, though, so so you can already get that before we even add the roux. Uh, speaking of which, I probably should have mentioned this before. Uh, but when you take your roux out, once you've made your roux and you pour it into something, I'm using a, I was using a container like this in order to pour it in, just a bowl. Uh, Careful about using a plastic container to pour your roux in because it's very, very thick, very, very hot. And it's, it's really, really difficult to clean those. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, you almost ruin the container if you do that. But um, this, this seems to be a trend about plastic burning. Yeah, yeah absolutely it is. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't have a smoke, a smoke alarm yet, all right? You're doing pretty good. Yeah, well, it's because the moment I burned it, I knew it immediately. <laughs> it's like, oh, no. Yeah, I suppose it's one of the reasons why you're not supposed to really talk while you're making that. <laughs> I suppose it's the first time I've ever tried to have a conversation while making it before. I'm throwing zucchini in. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. All kinds of vegetables you can do. Oh, speaking of, though. 
Green onions, when you do dice those up and you chop them, you want to throw those in very, very late because green onions will wilt. So uh, it's not that big of a deal in a gumbo, but that tends to be the last thing you want to add alongside the shrimp because shrimp will also, uh, they'll, they'll cook too hard. They'll dry out. So the last things you tend to want to add are going to be your green onions and your shrimp, generally speaking, at the same time. Just look how, look how pretty these are. I mean, they're just farmer's market, little zucchinis. They're just, they're yeah, very pretty. Honestly, I think it's pretty difficult to go wrong with vegetables in a gumbo. I, I think there's a couple things you need, uh, but then beyond that, everything else is just kind of, what do you feel like? Right? What do you feel like today? Yeah, you've inspired me. I'm throwing in all of my leftover vegetables. <laughs> it's a leftover dish. <laughs> it's in the name. Uh, don't forget, you need to have a little bit of garlic, though. Yeah. I'm going to take a few of these cloves myself, dice them up, and then pop them in. Now, there's a bit of a trick with garlic if you really want to go crazy. You can actually take the full clove, like you've got an actual massive clove of garlic, and you can just throw the whole thing in and let it seep. Um, but then you kind of have to clean it up after you're done. I'm not the biggest fan of that. There are a couple of things like that that you can do with gumbo. For example, one of the things my grandmother used to do is with this rotisserie chicken, she wouldn't just peel off all the chicken. She'd actually take the full rotisserie chicken and then slap it right into the bowl. Uh, if you're going to do that, careful about what kind of bowl you're using. If it's cast iron or a, a pot, if it's cast iron, you can get it out eventually. It is a nightmare to, to clean it, but you'll get it out eventually. Two big downsides, though, <clears throat> are that if you do it that way, I mean, the big upside, of course, is if you do it that way, you get, the, you get all of the chicken off. Um, and your broth is going to taste a lot better because there's a lot of flavor in chicken bone. But the big downside is you're going to get so much cartilage in there too and then a lot of little bones. <clears throat> and I just, I personally despise that, so I never do it that way. But um, Oh, wimp. Yeah, I know, right? The only, way to, make, bones the only out of way to work with blood. chicken stock is with bones. <laughs> you do it long enough, the cartilage gets boiled out and it actually gives you a thicker... Um, in fact, um, there, uh, when I make a pork tonkatsu, I mean, I'm using pork feet deliberately to get that like cartilage out of it. To... Ugh. See, whenever I try that, it never works quite for me, quite well for me. I can't stand pork feet when they're not, when it's not completely boiled off. And well, you, never, don't, you, don't never pork feet. you don't eat the pork feet. You're just using them to render out to get a thick collagen and, uh, the flavor for the soup. Then you take the pork feet out. Oh, I see. Yeah, and a lot of Louisiana cooking, we actually use pork feet, but we use the whole pork feet, and you actually eat the pork foot. Um, not in a soup. I, 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 not in a soup. Yeah, not even in a soup. Uh, oftentimes, it's actually fried pork feet. Um, I, I hate it. I think it's completely the, one of the most disgusting things I've ever put in my mouth. <laughs> I absolutely despise it. Because they're oh, it's so, like, not even gamey. It's just – it's not even slimy. It's just – it's like chewing rubber bands. Oh, I hate it. But, uh, but it is actually a, a fairly common Louisiana dish for, like, fried pork feet and such. I mean, you wouldn't see it in, in New Orleans because there's too many tourists. But uh, my family's from Lake Charles. And you will see something like that there. But yeah, it's not, it's not my favorite. <laughs> I do mm. not recommend it. <laughs> you got to ask yourself with a lot of these kind of dishes, right? Who originally came up with the idea that I'm like, I'm going to take, a, I'm gonna take a, a pig. I'm going to take their foot. I'm going to chop that sucker off. And then I'm going to eat it. So <laughs> there's, a his, there's actually a history to it. Oh, is there? Yes. Um, Speaking diplomatically, um, uh -oh. there, there were folks, and, and actually you see this in uh, Jewish cooking. Um, back in the day, brisket was not a choice cut of meat. Nobody wanted brisket. It was like the thing you threw away. Um, and pork's feet and a lot of offal and intestines and things like that were the parts of the pig that you, you got if you're, you were at the social class of getting the leftovers. So that's actually how those became part of that cuisine is it were it was the the leftovers that nobody else would eat. Yeah, there's a lot of things that came out of that. Some of them are actually really really good. Gumbo's leftover dish, kind of, but um, but yeah, I, I can totally see that. 
observation will drive a lot of folks to that. During the uh, Second World War, the other side of my family, so one side is from Louisiana, um, we're all African American, and the other side of the family is from the Netherlands. And so during the uh, Second World War, my grandfather and great-grandfather, the way that they survived was off of mold. Off of what? Mold. 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 Growing mold on yeah. bread. And then mold. Mold. Yeah. 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 Actually, evidently works. Well, I haven't had that mold. in Sears school. They taught us to eat mold, too. Oh, did they? I, they, I didn't have that course. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, that was part of survival training. You can or also... Maybe, you can also maybe I just completely ignored it. It's totally possible. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it was, it was eating old. All right, I've got a really thick soup going on here. This looks delicious. Hmm. Thick can be good, but um, have you had your ruin yet? Yep. Okay. Yeah, no, it's in there. I got, yeah, thick with roux. <clears throat> yep. So you get thick with roux, and then also it's a lot- So many things I've thrown in. Like there's just, it's like competing with water. <laughs> Yeah, thicker, thicker in my opinion is better, uh, but but it does thicken up a lot once it gets colder. So as long as it's warm, it's it's a lot looser. Um, it's a bit difficult to, to identify exactly what is right, right, as far as thickness goes before it's done. Um, mm. Mwah. So good. So good. Yeah. So in terms of uh, keeping the, the teen happy. Um, one of our, I'm going to say sponsors also. So uh, Keenan Skelly sent me over a custom bottle of um, hot sauce. And Ooh. what is going to go in my personal bowl, because it's too spicy for the general, is, of course, Dan Tentler's Nope Sauce. And this one is Nope version 3 with Extra Jeff. Extra Jeff. <laughs> My dog over here is having a field day. Every time I cut a couple sausage lengths, I'm like, here you go. <laughs> All right. Have you put any oregano in yet? Yep. Nice. Yeah, so we want to add in a little bit of oregano. Um, the amount depends on what you want. That's kind of the idea with, with gumbo is everything just depends a little bit on what you want. Um, I'm a little bit liberal with oregano. Uh, oregano doesn't change the flavor too much, but it does make a lot for for an um, aromatic, like very, very heavily there. Mm. All right. My gumbo is perfect. I'm happy. <laughs> did you add your hot sauce in already? Yep. Just did that. All right. So in my case, I'm about to do that too. I'm going to use Tabasco. Tabasco is the kind of traditional hot sauce for this kind of thing. Uh, you can use whatever you like. I'm going to use more than you probably want, but uh, I like my gumbo a little bit spicy. Where do you stand on Tabasco versus Crystal? Um, I don't even know if I use Tabasco anymore because I like it so much as because it's just what I grew up on. So if I'm making kind of that kind of family style dish like this, it, it's just gotta be Tabasco. Uh, not because it's the best, I'm not even saying it is. Maybe, maybe there's better choices, but um, when I add in Tabasco to a gumbo, it feels like home for me, so there's just no other choice. So in my case, I held off on the root a little bit longer. I'm adding that into my side right now. So have you ever thought about starting your own restaurant at some point? Oh no, I couldn't do this every day. <laughs> I really enjoy cooking, but only in like a nuanced sense. Like if I had to actually make meals to order or something, no, no, there's no way I could do that. Um, If it's more of a, I feel like this, this sounds really good right now and I'm kind of interested in how it's going to make and making the process of making. Oh yeah, I could totally do that. But um, if I were to do a restaurant, it'd be like that, um, oh, that one gentleman in Japan. I don't know if you've heard of this restaurant, but there's a sushi place in Japan uh, where the guy goes out and he gets specific cuts of fish every single day and you don't get to order. He makes what he's going to make and you get to pick off that list. And I've not been myself personally, despite the fact that I've lived in Japan for three years, but um, I hear it is one of the most magical experiences, eating experiences in the world. 
that I could potentially do because then it's more of a journey of discovery every time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like if it was like rote making things from a recipe, I can't. I don't have the patience. At this point, it's actually getting pretty close to about done. Uh, have you added in your green onions or your shrimp yet? Um, so I do shrimp a little differently. I've heard. <laughs> yeah. So I have these. These shrimp go in two minutes before I'm ready to plate. So I, I blanch them. They are half cooked. The middle is still raw. Then I peel them after I put them in an ice bath. And then I throw them at the very end. And they cook just enough that I need, and they maintain the juice, juiciness, and I don't have to worry about the shell. So I get a very, very awesome. Yeah, that's probably, probably the better way to do it, it honestly. Um, yeah, that's probably the better way to do it, honestly. I'm a little bit lazy. Um, in fact, the way you're doing it is probably cheaper as well, if I'm, I would imagine. Oh, so here's the other thing. You don't even have to defrost your shrimp. I did it straight with frozen shrimp. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, yeah. I defrosted mine for a little while. But to be fair, I've put frozen shrimp in gumbo before. It's not ideal, but it's not the worst thing. So you let me know when we are two minutes from plating, and that's when my shrimp go in. Okay, how about your green onions? You put those in yet? Yep. Okay. Yeah, uh, I have so everything but shrimp. I have every, everything is in here now. So we are probably really close to two minutes from plating. At this point, what I normally do is I take mine and I take the temperature and I dial it down fairly really significantly so it's not quite boiling, a bit more of a simmer. That's normally when I add in my green onions just to avoid a little bit of them wilting. And then I take my frozen shrimp <laughs> because I'm not nearly as cool as Bryson. <laughs> and then I start adding those suckers in. Uh, to be fair, my frozen shrimp here have been thawing for several hours. Uh, when I'm thawing the shrimp, I normally will put them in the refrigerator overnight or for at least like five or six hours, and then I'll pull them out beforehand and then toss them in. Uh, there are better ways to do shrimp, like you were talking about. In fact, your way is almost certainly better than this, but um, I'm a little lazy when it comes to this part. Because <laughs> normally at this part of my arms, little swords, I've been, I've been, I've been just like spinning that rune nonstop, and uh, I'm ready to go. I'm going to hold this up to the camera here so we can kind of see what it's supposed to look like. Color-wise, we're looking for something like this. Ooh, can't we see it? No, we can't. I can't actually quite tilt that enough. We're going to skip that part. All right. So you you just threw frozen shrimp in, so I don't think you're two minutes away yet. I am probably like five minutes yeah. away. So I'll wait. At this point, I'll often take a top and put it on top of the pot as well, keep a little bit of steam in. But um, as far as making it, that's about it. I imagine your rice is probably done by now. Yep, my rice is good. Cool beans. Yeah, so as far as plating goes, it's very, very easy with gumbo. That's the easiest part about plating. Or you just put it on gumbo, if you will. You take a bowl, you put in some rice, you grab yourself a scoople, scooper, and you clop it in. Now, for gumbo, I will generally use a different spoon than I use for stirring. I'll use a ladle like this. That's because that, um, that sauce is so good. Oh, man. Um, so I'll do that a bit as well. All right, so, uh, well, we got three minutes for story time. <laughs> I love that story about Deadwood where you uh, were... Um, oh, right. You, you, you got a impromptu date with TSA. Where I did you a striptease and them. I didn't get those dollar bills. Ah. Let's see what happened there. Um, well, I suppose you start with your, uh, what was it, the, the, the joke? Because I don't actually remember that part. Oh, okay. Well, so, yeah, you were actually ahead of me in the line. You got pulled to the side. Oh, that was it. You forgot your ID. That's a story, by the way. I'll get to that. Um, and then afterwards, I can't remember what was the setup for the joke, but so your, your husband is a Marine. Yep. And I made the joke. Well, you've also been in the Marine Corps. <laughs> it was, it was very naughty. <laughs> I don't 
don't know how I don't remember that. <laughs> Maybe I completely just tuned it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I made that joke, and I was like, "You need to tell him that," because uh, oh, you don't wow. know Matt. Matt was in the Air Force, which is not the military. So I told him this was his chance to say how he was in the military. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly right. Completely agree. In fact, yep. Um, let's see. Preliminaries to getting getting a strip search by TSA and letting the TSA in me too. Um, let's see how'd that go. All right, so once upon a time in Deadwood, South Dakota. Ooh, Deadwood, South Dakota. Um, it was the end of the conference. As these things go, everyone's sad, crying on shoulders. Ah, oh, terrible. And um, I was doing the responsible thing. And I was staying actually, well, this isn't the responsible thing, but I was staying on a hotel just next to that hotel because Deadwood's very small, so everything's full. And um, so I was at the bar. As one does at the end of the uh, the conference, all the conference presentations were over and all those kind of things. And there were people getting very, very drunk. And I was doing the responsible things. These folks were my friends. So Jonathan Ham, you know John Ham? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so he was very, very drunk. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. And so I, I walked into his room up some stairs, uh, and then I came back. In fact, somebody left beforehand and told me, "Hey, watch John because he needs help." So I I, I watched John and I helped him up. And then uh, I did that like two or three more times with the people. And then eventually I became that person. <clears throat> yes, I became that person. And I think, mind you, this is, I think, I helped Derek Rook up to his room. But all I remember is that at some point I woke up, no, this wasn't at the, at the end of the conference, this was the day before the end. Uh, I woke up in my room with Derek's wallet, his iPad, his iPhone, um, I don't think I had his computer, but all kinds of his stuff. And uh, he was giving a conference presentation like three hours from then. Like he was going to give a presentation at it. And I'm like, I have all of his stuff. I can't even call him because I've got his phone. <laughs> so I, I get back and I, I, I find him. I get him his phone. I get him his stuff. And then I realized that what happened is we traded all of our things. I had all of his stuff. He had all of my stuff, including most likely my wallet. I got the wallet back. I didn't get my driver's license back. <laughs> so I show up uh, the next day. We're going, we're leaving the conference at this point at the airport. And I don't have a driver's license. I'm like, I have no idea how I get on the airplane without ID. Evidently, there is a way. You show TSA your credit card. I, I'm not making this up. Seriously, I'm making this up. You give TSA your credit card. They strip search you. Takes a little while. And they let you on the plane. Um, I'm actually not making this up. This is totally how it works. <laughs> So I'm sitting there getting strip searched. And I'm thinking the whole time, I can hack this process, right? Like if I wanted to get on the plane illegally, I can totally take advantage of this because they didn't validate the credit card or anything. They just, they just took it. So I could have printed out one of these cards, um, even did the magnetic strip tricks to make an actually legit card if I needed to, but they didn't check that either. Um, but they needed two forms of alternative ID uh, verification. So the credit card is one, which totally could have been fake. What do they take for seconds? Um... I think it was a receipt. Like it was a receipt for a restaurant or something that happened to have my name on it. Like it was legitimately a receipt. No, you, you were trying, was it the receipt or was, I thought you, um, you were trying to use like your conference pass or something. No, it was, you're right. It was a receipt. It was a receipt. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Uh, but yeah, that was it. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and then they, they give you some, uh, they call it enhanced security screening, uh, which means that, that Bryson got a, got a, you were recording that, right? Uh, no, I did not record it. Oh, I, 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 tried, I actually tried to, intercede, <laughs> I tried to intercede on your behalf. Oh, you did. I remember that. You totally did do that. <laughs> yes. No, I was like, hey, like, I can vouch for him. And, like, I'm kind of a known entity to your organization. So, like, <laughs> it didn't matter. But, yeah, at long last, I did get on the plane. It all worked out. Well, and this is why Colonial Pipeline happened. Yes. <laughs> but even more interesting on that story, well, not more interesting, I suppose, but even further on that story, you know what? I never replaced the driver's license. I have not gotten behind the wheel of a car since. That was what, two and a half years ago? Uh, Wait, no. Yeah. It couldn't have been that long. A year and a half? No, nope. it was, uh, it was uh, October 2019. 19, yeah. I suppose this year will be going on too. Mm. All right, I'm ready. I'm plated. I am plating. Ooh, this is I'm trying not to eat this right now because I really want to eat it. 
I don't want to ruin my picture. So I'm adding my Dan Tentler Nope sauce with extra Jeff. Huh. This one turned out particularly good, I think, actually. <laughs> it yeah. was the conversation that made for the better dish. You know what? That is what I love about cooking is it's all about mm, the people. People get to eat with. People get to make it with. And that is, this is the first time I've made a really authentic gumbo. So I'm excited. All righty. You let me know when you're ready. I'm all ready. I'm going to have to tilt it down a little bit because I don't want to spill it this time. I've been doing that the whole time. Oh, yeah, so how I, dog. I have to tilt mine too. Hello, dog. All right. <clears throat> hot, hot, hot. Hold on. My glove. I need a glove. It's too hot. Go. Oh yeah, see the steam off mine. Woo! Oh, that's pretty. Ready? Boom. Shock. All right. <laughs> Gumboleo. Gumboleo. All the way. So, right, it. closing this out. Oh, fantastic. We donate again to Trevor Project. Trevorproject.com. Again, fantastic charity, helping out so many people who are in circumstances that are just beyond their control. Um, and isn't that what charity's for, right? Isn't that exactly what charity's for? Mm. Oh my gosh, that's delicious. Ooh, the zucchini really adds like a nice layer to it. I recommend yeah. zucchini. Hmm. Really nice. I'll have to try that sometime. I've never actually done zucchini with it before. Um, hashtag unicorn chef. We want to see your gumbo, make it your way. I think one of the biggest things that came out of this is a, other than a few basics of get your root to where the smoke alarm does not go off <laughs> at a tomato base. And then after that, throw in whatever you got. We want to see it. Hashtag unicorn chef. We'll catch you next week. Thank you very much. Take care.